So hello, welcome to St. George's Tron. If this is your first visit, uh, you are very welcome here. It's lovely to have Andrew and Michelle here. Andrew and Michelle are, are regulars. They come once a year uh, <laughs> when Celtic Connections is on and they've not been able to be here for, well, last year anyway. So it's lovely to have you with us. Please take our greetings back to your church down south. Uh, but welcome to those of you who've never been here before. My name's Alistair Duncan. I'm the minister here in St. George's Tron. Um, warm welcome to those of you that are joining us by live stream. I know a few are for various reasons, and uh, it's good to know that you're with us. Um, Torsten uh, Koenig, who is a ministry student in training for ministry in the Church of Scotland and on placement here at St. George's Tron, is going to be preaching today. Torsten will introduce himself later on, but just so that you know, that's what's happening. Um, as far as the notices are concerned, just a few things. Um, we still, unfortunately, still bound by the mask rule. Um, I'm hoping that that might relax in time to come. Certainly, the Church of Scotland is negotiating with the Scottish Government to see if it can be relaxed in some measure or not. Um, even if that is the case, we will always seek to lay out the seating and so on in such a way that you can sit as close or as far away as you want. Next Sunday, we're going to go back to doing kind of cafe style with tables and hospitality. It won't be lunch, it'll just be the tea, coffee and nibbles that we were doing uh, up until that got stopped again. So we're going to go back to doing that next weekend. But again, I repeat, we will make provision uh, for people to sit further away if they are not comfortable yet to be at that kind of distance. So you do have the options to choose. Um, um, in terms of... Uh, yeah, so as far as we are today, then please keep your mask on. Make sure it covers your nose and your mouth, especially when we're singing. Um, giving is at the box at the back and via the Church of Scotland website, the IZETO hiccup. Um, I really need to sort that one out. <laughs> I, just, I looked at it on my notes and I thought, I said this last week and it's not sorted yet. Uh, I forgot to chase them this week. Okay, um, but we, you can still give in the box or via the Church of Scotland website on the front page. You can go down, scroll to the bottom of the front page. There's a link there, nominate a congregation, and you can give uh, online that way if that's easier for you. Rhythm of the week remains the same. Uh, today, we have talk back at five o'clock. Just a bunch of folks gather on Zoom to reflect on the passage, the preach, any questions, any further reflections. We dig a bit deeper maybe explore some aspects of the thing that we didn't you know, get to in the actual service or the sermon itself. So if that sounds interesting to you, then I'll give you the Zoom link. Just ask me. I can text it, message it to you, whatever. That's not a problem. Uh, through the week, the Young Adults Group and the Young Professionals Group are both on on Wednesday night. Um, I don't know who's here. Oh, Adam's here. Yep. So Young Adults Group, Adam Maroon uh, sweatshirt there. Speak to him. And Young Professionals, Laura's over there. Oh, you're currently meeting on Thursday nights. Radical shift, okay? So if you're interested in being in the Young Professionals group, and if suddenly moving from a Wednesday to a Thursday opens up a world of possibilities for you, then go and speak to Laura, uh, and she'll tell you what that is and what it's for. Uh, Wednesdays, of course, we also pray, 7 o'clock. Um, uh, we gather on Zoom at 7 for an hour just to pray for this, to pray for all our services, to pray for uh, people who are in particular need. Uh, if you have prayer requests, then you can message them to the church, uh, and uh, we will pray for them. Uh, but if you want to join in and play your part in asking God to bless and use uh, the ministry and the mission of St. George's Tron, then 7 o'clock on Wednesday, uh, it's just an hour, um, and, and you're, we'd love to have more folks join. That would be great. Um, Midweek service is on on Wednesday, 1.15 to 1.45. So we have a, a service here um, going through Galatians, going through the fruit of the Spirit at the moment. Um, so if you want to come along, you've got half an hour in lunchtime at Wednesday, come along then, uh, a simple little service. On the 17th of February, uh, we're going to be starting uh, uh, or hosting a big Scottish Alpha in conjunction with Alpha Scotland. They're going to be, uh, we're, we're going to be doing it as a partnership live in this space, so there will be an actual in-person alpha with food and all the usual uh, bits that make alpha. Alpha is an introduction to the Christian faith for people who don't know and want to know, who know a little and want to know more, who want to check their foundations, all sorts of reasons why people do alpha. Really good thing to invite people to come along to. Um, we've got some leaflets, actually, which I will scuffle around and make available at the end. Fresh leaflets, which have got the, the, the new date on them. 
Um, uh, but but you, you know or you've been told. By next weekend, you will also have postcards. And we're going to give everybody about three postcards uh, and, and challenge you. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll just have the details on one side, be blank on the other side. So the challenge is to think or pray, who might I just write a wee friendly message in the back and say, saw this and thought of you and pass it on to somebody as an invite. So we'll have those for you next weekend. Um, they're not quite ready yet. Their Alpha office is producing those. Um, so that's starting on the 17th of February. Somebody got in touch to ask me because we're doing it as a hybrid. Um, some people even from Glasgow who are connected to us still want to do it online rather than in person. Yes, you can. You can join online if you'd rather. The Alpha experience is at its best if you can do it in person because that's when you actually get to eyeball people across a table and have the conversation. But not everyone's ready for that and we respect that. So if uh, you'd like to do it, but just not online, then you can, you'll can. you be able to join remotely, be put into a breakout room with other people from, uh, loosely from St. George's Tron or around uh, this fellowship. And the idea is that other congregations can link in as well. And equally, they will have the opportunity either to uh, link in remotely to do something in person in their church or fellowship uh, and just uh, link in for the live stream just for the welcome and to watch the video and then go into live small groups or to link in remotely and do the whole thing uh, remotely but the sophisticated technology that Alpha Scotland are using will allow them to group people so that if you are in Cumnock and you're part of a group of people doing the Alpha course from a particular church then when you go into a breakout room on Zoom you'll go into the breakout room with other folk from your fellowship uh, of your connection. So it will just means it's not going to be a random mix so that you're going to be having someone from Tobermory in a room with someone from Strathpeffer in a room with someone from, I don't know, um, Gala Shields. Um, it, it's to keep people so that after the course is finished, there can be follow-up continuity, connection, relationship, and so on. Sorry for the big, long explanation, but I just wanted to make it clear. Uh, hopefully it is. Leadership team. I forgot to say we have a meeting on Tuesday evening. Um, can you please speak to me afterwards uh, as to whether we do it in person or online? Uh, I'm trying to work out what's the best thing to do uh, for us. We might do a hybrid, um, but speak to me afterwards and, um, or put something in the leadership team WhatsApp chat, please, um, so that I know what we're doing. Um, I think that's everything I need to say. There are scones at the back, so if you're here in the building, then take a bag of three scones away. That's the closest you're getting to hospitality this week. Um, but next week it will be different. Um, and I think that's all I want to say. So let's take a moment just to file those little thoughts somewhere where we can find them later, but not be preoccupied with them just now. And let's pray. And then we're going to stand and declare the words of Psalm 40. Living God, Heavenly Father, the source from whom each of us derives the one whose image we bear, the first and the last, we come to you who are other and holy and almighty. We come to you, Lord, who are glorious and splendid and wonderful. Were our eyes to behold you, Lord, we could not cope or contain. And yet, Lord, we come to you because you incline towards us. Through Jesus, by your Spirit. And so, Lord, we are here grateful that you desire to find and seek and pursue a people for yourself. And so as we come to you today, Lord, we say, here I am. Lord, come and meet with me. Be in this place. 
be with those who are watching remotely. Presence yourself where people of faith gather with expectation and in worship to know you, to be reconnected to you. And so, Lord, as we begin our worship together, we thank you that you invite us into this place of fellowship and belonging and connection with you, where we hear and know your presence, for we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let us then stand. We're going to see verses 1 to 8 of Psalm 40, and then uh, Emily and Ruth and Laura are going to lead us in our sung worship. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart.
Out upon the waters, out of our places of ease or comfort, sometimes familiarity. You call us beyond what we've perhaps known, but you call us to trust you. And so as we bless your name and sing our praise, as we come into your presence and recognize who you are, the maker and creator of all things, we recognize, Lord, that you have a call and a claim on our lives, that we were bought at a price. And as we worship, Lord, we thank you that we may come with confidence because Jesus has given himself that we might know forgiveness and freedom from our past and have hope for the future. And so, Lord, we bring ourselves as we are and pray for your renewal and cleansing your forgiveness, but also, Lord, for your infilling and empowering. And ask, Lord, that in the time we spend listening and responding to your word, that, Lord, you may find in us a willingness to recognize you not just as Savior, but as Lord. So hear us as we pray. And as we pray with one voice, as Jesus taught us, and we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Torsten's going to come and lead us in worship, and if you see any more candles that are about to set the place on fire, you know, just do flag and down. Yeah, also, also good morning from me, and uh, my name, Thorsten Koenig, may have given it away already, I'm German. Don't be scared. <laughs> because we also lived in the Netherlands. Don't be scared even more. And then we moved to Scotland. Well, that is a that is a good part, because moving to Scotland, I started to train to become a minister in the Church of Scotland, and I'm now in my second year. That means I have to do three years at the University of Glasgow, and in parallel, I do placements in, in different congregations, and that is now my second placement here at St. George's Town. So you have to, to bear with me until Easter and a bit, little bit longer. And I'm delighted to be here, and I enjoy being among you and worshiping God. Our reading today is taken from, so we continue our journey through Luke, 
And from the Gospel of Luke, we are reading on chapter 9, the verses 37 to 45. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit sees him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions, and so that he had foam at, so that he foams at the mouth. I scarcely ever leaves him, and it is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the grounds in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen careful to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Thanks be to God for his word. May it be a light on our way. Amen. Two weeks ago, when Alistair and I sat together, we do that once a week in the, yeah, it's part of my training to talk with Alistair about different things, how i going on with my training at the university, what is about mission, what is about the church, different important topics, but we also are planning what I'm going to preach. And we went back and forth, and finally we agreed on the text we just read. And some of you may have read along in your own Bibles, and you may have been surprised. In case you have the new international version of the Bible, the chapter we started is headed, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. And other translations may have different headers of chapters, but they all are similar. And then we continued even into the next chapter. And that is titled, Jesus predicts his death a second time. So my first reaction was, whoa, what do these two chapters have in common? Two chapters which seem to have nothing to do with each other. Well, maybe Alistair is challenging me. But then I wondered why I'm surprised. I learned from my studies that the original texts which the early Christians had in their hand had no chapters and no verses at all. And of course, that made it quite difficult to read and even more difficult to study. What a nightmare for modern theologians. So during the medieval times, there were attempts to introduce chapters and structures into the Bible text but everybody did its own way. And can you then imagine you are, for example, a student in the 13th century in Paris, and your lecturer refers to a certain chapter, and you simply cannot find it? So one of the students in Paris, an Englishman, hmm, Stephen Langton, devoted himself to consolidate all the existing systems, and his way to arrange the Bible into chapters became so popular that it spread all over Europe and we use it still today. And then later in the late 16th century, a French scholar and printer, sorry, this time a Frenchman, Robert Estienne set himself the goal to make this Bible study easier. And so in 1553, he published the first complete Bible in French with chapters and verses. And this is what we have still today. Well, with all the structures inserted into the Bible, I was wondering if there is not a risk that we focus too much on certain chapters 
and we forget the bigger picture. We need to remind ourselves that the Gospels are stories. They tell us a story of Jesus, they tell the story of his disciples, and they tell the story of individuals like you and me. The, the Gospels tell us what people have experienced in their lives when they met Jesus. So for a moment, let us pause and look what happened so far in Luke's account. In Luke's account about Jesus, about the disciples, and about normal people. Jesus and his disciples traveled from one village to another. Jesus taught, he told the people about the kingdom of God. We read about how Jesus healed people, he calmed the storm, fed 5,000 with just only five bread and two fish, and Jesus even raised a dead girl. Two Sundays ago, we heard how Peter declared that Jesus is the Messiah, how he, and how Jesus predicts his death for the first time. And last Sunday, last Sunday we heard how the, people, how the disciples saw Jesus among Moses and, Eli and Elijah. Jesus among these two important men for the history of Israel, and they came and speak with Jesus on a mountain. And was that not proof that Jesus is divine? And what a great journey. What a great story. What a glorious time of teaching, miracles. Even Peter seemed to have got it finally. Jesus is a Messiah. A glorification on the mountain. What else could come? And then at the beginning of our chapter, and here we have it again, a chapter, we read, Jesus had called the twelve together. He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to curse diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, and they healed the sick. And now the disciples are back. Back from the journey through the villages. Back from the mountains where they saw all this glory and reality hits. Again, a father with a possessed child. Again, healing required. The disciples struggled and failed again. They could not heal the child, so Jesus had to step in again. And again, Jesus told them something important, that he will have to die and again, the disciples didn't get it. And even better, they even did not ask, dare to ask him. This is what I really love about those Gospels. They are not accurately composed novels. They are not fiction. The Gospels are an account of real life. The Gospels... We, in the Gospels, we hear about real individuals with their individual lives, with their struggles, with their questions, read about their expectations, and we read about their disappointments. So let us have a closer look. Let us stand next to the father of the possessed child and next to the disciples. The father had a poss possessed child. Potentially, the child was already possessed for a long time. And most likely, the father consulted other healers and doctors before. From his address to Jesus, we know that he met Jesus' disciples before. Remember, Jesus has sent his disciples into the villages to tell the people about God's kingdom. And he gave them power to drive out demons. The father may have approached the disciples in his home village. He may have asked them to help his child, and the disciples tried, but they failed. They could not heal the child. What a disappointment for the father, and what a disappointment for the disciples. But I admire the father. Despite his disappointment, he did not give up. 
Maybe what the disciples told him about Jesus left an impression on him. An impression that was so powerful that he got hope. Despite of their failure. Maybe he had met Jesus before. Maybe he had heard what Jesus was saying. Maybe even he has experienced how Jesus healed somebody else. And he was not put off by the failure of the disciples. Despite all, somehow, he had hope and trust that Jesus may be able to help his child. He took an extra effort and approached Jesus directly. And Jesus healed the child. I admire this father because he did not give up. Was it out of desperation or out of trust or out of hope? Most likely a mixture of both of it. He did not know if Jesus will heal his, heal his child. He hoped and he went and he asked. And this is real life. How often are we in a situation where we are looking for answers for healing or for a good outcome? A sick child trouble in the family, time for a job change. And then we may meet people who, with all good intention, give us advice, want to help us. They may even tell us about their faith and how they experience how God has helped them. And still, this does not help us. In our situation, nice words, but no light at the end of the tunnel. Then, this father may serve us as an example of perseverance. Or better, then this father may serve us as an example of hope. As someone who was not put off by the failure of Jesus' disciples. An example of someone who turns to Jesus directly, despite his experiences with the disciples. Someone not giving up hope, but someone who continues to trust in Jesus himself again and again. Real life. Now, let us turn to the disciples. Their encounter with the father had not been a success story. They failed to help the father. It required Jesus to drive out the demon. Jesus had to step in and had to accomplish where they failed. Jesus had to step in and had to accomplish what they thought Jesus had called them to do. And what Jesus said did not help either. Jesus said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Was this directed only to the Father or only to them? And if this is not enough, while everybody was still marveling, Jesus turned directly to his disciples. He said, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of man. Listen carefully. This is important. I will have to die. This is not the first time that Jesus predicts his death. The disciples have heard it before, just recently but they did not understand what it meant. They did not get it. And more, they were afraid to ask him about it. The disciples must have felt miserable. Now you may say, whoa, 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 wait a moment. This is not fair. The disciples do not deserve this. It was at the end, it was Jesus who sent them out into the villages. And it was Jesus who gave them power and authority to drive out demons. So, was it not Jesus' failure when the disciples could not help the child? And when Jesus told them that he will die, the disciples could not understand because it was hidden from them. They had no chance to understand. This is not fair. And you're right. An author of a novel or a good piece of fiction would never dare to write something like this because no one would really like to, to read something 
which is not fair. In a good novel, we would read that disciples managed to heal the child, or we would read that their failure to heal the child was because of their lack of faith, but not in Luke's gospel. No reason is given why the disciples could not drive out the demon. And why is it hidden, why is it hidden from them to understand? No reason. This is not the way you write a successful piece of fiction. This is not the way you win the Booker Prize or let alone the Nobel Prize. It appears that Luke totally missed out on a good ending for his gospel. We heard about the Transfiguration last Sunday. Would this not have been a good ending for a good piece of fiction? Or even better, turning from the Transfiguration directly to Jesus' passion and then to the resurrection. But Luke did not write a great piece of fiction. He did not construct a great arc of suspense from the glorious picture of Jesus among Moses and Elijah to the tortured and the dying Messiah. The Gospels are no fiction. The Gospels are different. Jesus tells about the kingdom of God again and again. Just different aspects, just different parables. Jesus demonstrates that he has divine authority. He foretells his death. And we read that women are the first to testify about Jesus' resurrection. We learn how the disciples are enthusiastic at times and struggle at times. We read how Jesus touches life of so many. The Gospels are no fiction. The Gospels are more than a story. The Gospels are about the living God. The Gospels are about the loving God who promised to be with us. The Gospels testify how the loving God gets involved in the life of real people because he wants no one to be lost. The Gospels are about real people, real life. So, back from the mountain, real life hits the disciples. Back from the mountain where they got a glimpse of glory, disciples were confronted with their failure. Back from the mountains, they did not understand what Jesus told them and then did not dare to ask. And this is similar to our lives. At least I have similar experiences in my life. Well, in the same meeting two weeks ago with Alistair, I took the opportunity to ventilate my frustration. Why the heck has God called me out of my job where I was a boss and in control? Why the heck has God called me into the Church of Scotland, which is going currently through big turbulences, decline in membership, and congregational disappearance? Why the heck I'm studying three years at the University of Glasgow and collecting academic credits on subjects, well, let's be very polite, which have limited benefits for preparing me for my ministry. All these uncertainties. And sometimes it's really hard to understand for me. And you may have similar questions. You also may be in situations of uncertainties. What will tomorrow bring? Will my child be healed? Will I have a job? What does God want from me? And while I ventilated my frustration and question uncertainty to Alistair, I also remembered what God did so far in my life. It took him 20 years to call me into ministry. And God prepared everything that we came, that Astrid and I came to Scotland, and I can tell you Scotland was really not on our radar screen. It was more the north of Italy, the south of France. But this is another story. All I can say at this moment is that despite that I have no clue how my ministry in the Church of Scotland will look like, I know God called me. And somehow this call 
gives me more comfort and trust than I've ever experienced in my corporate life before. And that sounds familiar? Like the father of the child who went to Jesus despite the failure of the disciples. So let us, let us look beyond the chapters of our reading this morning. The gospel tells us, most importantly, one story. Jesus is risen. And when the gospels are no fiction, when the gospels are real life, then Jesus' resurrection is more than a story. When we believe that Jesus' resurrection, it's God's demonstration that all life is in his hands, beyond even death, then there is a new perspective to all uncertainties. Then there is a new hope for all questions. The story of the father did not end with the disciples' failure. Jesus healed this child. And God's story with the disciples did not end with their failure and ignorance. The disciples became the foundation of God's family, the church. God has demonstrated through Jesus' resurrection that his story with us will never end. There will be uncertainties. There will be questions. There will be struggles. But Jesus' resurrection, it's God's promise. Better, Jesus' resurrection is God's commitment that his story with us will never end. Let us pray. Holy God and Father, we thank you that you are the living one. You sent your son Jesus into our world. You sent your son Jesus to live among us. In Jesus, you walked among us, sharing our struggles, our questions, our uncertainties. Through Jesus, you, Holy Father, showed us that you are not a distant God, but that you are close to us because you love us. Jesus told us about your kingdom. Jesus demonstrated your power and authority over pain, evil, and even death. Jesus showed us how you want us to treat one another. And through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, you have conquered death for us. And now we stand before you, astonished and amazed of your love. A love we do not deserve. A love that overflows from you. A love that never ends. We can bring nothing to you, O oh God, but our faith, our thankfulness, and our worship. And that is all what you ask for. There are times, Holy Father, when we doubt your love. There are times, loving Father, when we find ourselves or others in dark places and we struggle to see your love, even struggle to cry for it. We come to you, O loving God, asking to nurture us, we come to your caring God with our prayers. So we pray for all who need healing. Healing of body or spirit. Healing for themselves or loved ones. Oh God, provide them with comfort and hope. We pray for all who are kept awake at night with questions. Questions what their purpose is. Questions what the next day or the next months will bring. Questions of faith. Oh God, guide them. We pray for our city, for our country, for our church. May your kingdom grow in our world and bring justice and love. You are the Holy One. You are the Living One. You are the Loving One. We worship you. Amen. Let us stand for our last hymn. Cool. 
the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I So go in faith, in peace, in the knowledge of God's love for you, and may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you, remain with you all this day and forevermore, till Jesus comes again or calls you home. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good to be with you. Thank you, those of you who were with us on stream, on live stream, joining us. Uh, grab some scones before you go, and... Uh, yeah, we're not chucking you out yet, so feel free to chat and mingle in socially distanced and appropriate ways. <laughs> <laughs>